What I want to do first is just start with a case. And um, this is Jason. He's a 10-year-old boy who presents with exquisite pain in his heels and feet, as well as low back and pelvic pain. The pain in the sacroiliac area is reproducible by palpation. A lab testing reveals a positive H HLA B27 with a normal set rate. Which of the following is most likely? Do you think he has juvenile inflammatory arthritis, formerly known as JRA? Does he have enthesitis, formerly known as a spondyloarthropathy? Does he have juvenile psoriatic arthritis? Does he have Lyme arthritis? Or does he have gonococcal arthritis? Okay, so look at him real quick. I'll give you a second here. And now I want you to vote. Okay, good. Very, very good. Now, 27% of you I know really well. And you looked ahead to see what we're going to talk about next. And you picked it. And that's what you've been doing for the whole last GI section. Because I know you didn't know some of those things he was talking about. And you were picking it because you saw, oh, he's talking about this. This is what this is. And so my point with this is, is you have to be very, very careful when you're doing questions. You really want to try to do them so you don't know what the subject area is. It's like it's really helpful. Oh, I'm doing room questions. Okay, this is going to be some room thing. Well, it could be an ID thing that's causing this arthritis, right? You know, well, 1% thought the poor 10-year-old had gon gonorrhea, you know, so, I mean, I guess it's possible, but, uh, you know, the, the point is when you're going through, it's easy if you're in a setting, if you're in the setting of a topic area and you're getting a question about it to know, to even figure, you know, it, that's a clue already, okay, this is a rheumatology thing, so you can kind of get your mind set in that, but if you're just looking at this question, you know, differently without being in rheumatology, You've got to sort out why is this a rheumatology thing versus an infectious disease thing, you know. So, I mean, clues here, he's 10. So, okay, probably not gonorrhea, okay. Lyme disease, you would kind of expect them to give you some geography, and they don't give you that, okay. So that can be a clue if they're trying to get you to think, you know, infectious disease they will give you some kind of epidemiologic thing. So that leaves you these three different um, rheumatologic things and you know some of you went with JIA because that's the most common thing and that's not always a bad thing to do the problem is is they gave you specifically kind of what's you know the classic history for enthesitis or the spondyloarthropathy okay with the lower back pain so that back pain that was your clue that this wasn't JIA okay this, this wasn't JRA or JIA that this was a spondyloarthropathy. And the, psori and the psoriasis part, we'll talk about, there's got to be specific things they'll give you on the test, like nail pitting or something like, or a rash or something like that that goes along with psoriasis. So for most of these rheumatologic things, there, there's going to be key words that you need to know on the test to clue in to what's going on because they're all going to sound the same in, in, after a while. All right, so this was B, okay, enthesitis. So most of you got it, which is really good. All right, so, but first... I want to talk about the most common thing, okay? So ju juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or JIA, and formerly known as JRA. The, by definition, they have to, it has to begin when they're younger than 16. So if they give you a 17-year-old on the test, and the first time they're showing up with something, don't think about JIA, okay? They probably have gonorrhea, right? <laughs> so, you know, so go with, you know, the age can be helpful here in, in, room, in the room questions. So it's got to be under 16. They've got to have synovitis uh, that's persistent in one or more joints. It's got to last for at least six weeks, okay? Most rheumatologists say three months. And then you have to exclude everything else, of course. And that's the problem in rheumatology is you've got to exclude all these other things. Um, but the prevalence is about one in a 1,000. So it's a common thing, and it definitely will be on your test. All right. These, this International League of Associations of uh, Rheumatology got together and classified the different causes of, of our different classifications of JIA, and we're going to go through these. I mean, this sounds like the Avengers, you know, they got together, the International League of Associations of Rheumatology, you know, and I'm JIA, and I'm, you know, psoriatic arthritis, you know, and then they go, well, he's the Hulk, and just smash, you know, okay. Okay. So clues on the test. So when I get a question and I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on, one thing is just look for some certain words. And the PEDS boards are very good about giving you the words to kind of get you going in a certain direction. So morning stiffness, 
that improves with movement later in the morning. Changes in walking, running, climbing, or willingness to play. So this is a kid that was normal, and now they're having, they're, they don't like to climb, like they used to go on the monkey bars, and now they don't like to do that, or they don't want to run outside and play anymore. If the kid's losing the ability to dress, feed, bathe, so milestones are being lost, if they have developed enuresis, and they've got some of this morning stiffness stuff going on, be thinking about this. Leg length discrepancies can show up. Okay. So the first one I want to talk about of the JIs is systemic onset, because this is kind of the bad one, okay? This is the one where you worry about um, it, it's got a lot more symptoms, a lot more things associated with it. So this one, you have to have fever. To have systemic onset JIA, you have to have fever. That's number one. So if the kid does not have fever, you know it's not systemic onset JIA. Usually they're going to have one or two fever spikes to 103, on a daily basis, so every single day they're having fever. Okay, and you can see if you looked at this question first and you didn't know what it was rheumatology, you'd be thinking infectious disease. So that's the point. You've got to be able, you need to do questions where they're kind of randomly thrown at you or figure out a way to figure, get questions so you don't know what the topic area is because on the test they don't have a big sign that says this is rheumatology, right? It just comes at you. Okay, usually the fevers are going to be in the evening time Usually the kid's going to complain of, of achiness and arthralgias. But, and when the fever's gone, this is kind of classic, the child is fine, okay, commonly fine, or better at least. This is about 10 to 20 percent of the cases of JIA. Boys and girls here are equal, so that can be a clue. If you, there's a boy with JIA, you want to be thinking maybe this could be systemic onset. The peak age, and this is important, all these, these main three we're going to talk about, there's going to be different age range you want to think about, and this is a 5 to 10-year-old range. All right, things to look for also with JIA, so you've got the fever, and then you want to look for a rash. They're going to describe a rash, and if they say it's salmon in color, a salmon-colored rash with this fever, you'd be very, very careful to be thinking about systemic onset JIA. That's what they're trying to get you to think about. Commonly involve the trunk, they'll be already on their thighs or maybe in their axilla. They may describe the Kebner phenomenon where if you do mild rubbing or scratching of the skin, that can bring out the rash. Now the arthritis they have can be oligo, and we'll talk about this in a minute with the next group, or poly, so four or less or, far or more, okay, so oligo is going to be one or two joints, poly is going to be five or six joints. So more commonly it's going to be a lot of joints because this is much more systemic disease. Other things you can see with this is, that, and this is where it kind of gets into the lupus thing, you start getting it, is could this be lupus or not, because they can have pericarditis, they can have pleuritis, okay, they can have a big spleen and liver, abdominal pain, weight loss and fatigue is, is very common with this as well, and the key here is uveitis is rare. As we're going to talk about with oligo, the oligo form of this, uveitis is very common. And so uh, uveitis in this one is rare, but it still occurs, okay? Now, it's systemic, so you're going to see a whole bunch of lab abnormalities. They're going to have a high Y count, sometimes greater than 40,000. They're going to have a high platelet count, acute phase reactant. They're going to have a high C-reactive protein, a high SED rate. They ha may have anemia. They may have a low albumin. Now, they're going to usually be rheumatoid factor negative, and they're and they're going to be ANA negative, and that'll be your clue that this is not lupus, but this is JIA. Okay, so the ANA will be negative. So that, for kids, pretty much means they don't have lupus. Okay, the other thing you need to be aware of is in these kids who have this disease, they can get this syndrome called macrophage activation syndrome. And what happens here is you get a big increase in the, in the liver enzymes, greater than 600 to 1,000 or around that range. And what happens is it's triggered by being on a drug like a sulfa drug or being put on NSAIDs. Well, what do we use to treat these kids with? So it may be they give you a kid who's been to the rheumatologist and they got started on some NSAIDs and now they come in with this syndrome with their liver enzymes going out. Okay, their PTT goes out, so they have a prolonged PTT. Their platelets, remember, they, remember they were in the millions, now they're going to drop to 50,000, just plummet. Okay, and their SED rate was really, really high, and now it's going to go down to nothing. Okay, so just be aware of this act macrophage activation syndrome. So it may occur when they start getting treatment for their systemic onset JIA. So the rheumatologist may see them, they come back to you in the primary care clinic, 
and then you need to be aware of this to treat it. We're going to treat it with steroids. I don't think they'll ask you about therapy. I just think they want you to identify it so you can call the rheumatologist and say, help, I need to, what do we need to do about this? Okay. Oligoarticular, the poly, we used to call it POSI, now it's called oligoarticular, JIA. This is when they have four or fewer joints, okay, four or fewer joints. Commonly, it's just one or two. On the exam, they'll make it pretty easy. They'll make it one or two joints. This is the most common form of JIA that we see, 40 60%. Now, look at the age group. So, this is a younger group, generally, one to seven years, okay, and much more common in girls. So if they gave me a four or five year old girl who started having, who's got arthritis in one or two joints, I'm thinking oligoarticular is what they're trying to get me to think. With this one, you have no fever, you have no rash, you have no night pain. If they have any of those three, then something else is going on. So that's a clue. So if they give you fever or a rash with this, they don't have that with oligoarticular. You need to be thinking about probably systemic or something else. Big thing you need to know for the test, I think, is if you, you have a kid that you're following your clinic, you need to be aware, they need to be followed, particularly if they have a positive ANA with this, so they only have a few joints, they have a positive ANA, this group is at big risk for getting uveitis, so they need to be followed by ophthalmology. And what they want you to do is you've got a kid with oligoarticular JIA, they have a positive ANA, they want you to do slit lamp exam every three months if it's been less than four years since the disease onset, okay? So if their disease is so in the early stages of the disease, you want to be following them very, very carefully the f every three months. A quarter of these kids won't have joints that are painful. They'll just have swelling, but it will be definite arthritis. You'll have swelling or you'll have, you'll have abnormality. It won't just be arthralgia. You'll have to see something abnormal there. Most common joints are the knees, ankles, elbows. Common in the test will give you the knee knee and the ankle. You can get small joints, hands of the joints involved too. Labs, 70% of these kids will have a positive ANA, but remember it doesn't have the fever or anything else like lupus. So don't get confused that this is lupus because they don't have fever. Okay, they don't have a rash. All they have is arthritis with one or two joints. The other labs are going to be normal. So they're, hemo they're not going to be anemic. They're not going to have a rheumatoid factor that's positive, their set rate, and CRP actually can be normal in many of these kids. The key, I think, for your test is to monitor for uveitis in them. Now, the polyarticular is five or more joints, and the, the, what's strange about this is, is, is how they die, how we categorize these kids, is how they present during their first six months. Now, they may change after that, but how they're diagnosed or designated is based on their first six months of presentation. So in the first six months, if they have five or more joints, then they're going to be polyarticular. It's about 30, 40 percent of the cases. Again, girls, much, much more common than boys. And look at the peak differences in age. So here we have really little girls, one to three. Okay, and then we have early adolescent kids, so 12 to 14. If they're getting it early, usually this is the R at rheumatoid factor negative girls. If they're getting an adolescence, they're usually rheumatoid factor positive, but they can be negative as well. If they have a positive rheumatoid factor, you need to be thinking about polyarticular JIA. The joints here are going to be small and large. It can be the spine, the hips, the shoulders. And again, the age will be helpful to you, okay? And then look for girls with this. The presenting symptom commonly in these girls is going to be fatigue. They'll come in just tired. Now, with this one, you can have fever and weight loss, and rheumatoid nodules may also occur. Okay, so the fever can occur with this one. There's many more joints involved. There's much more of a systemic type presentation. So these are, this is obviously an, older, an old person, but this is what the nodules can look like. The rheumatoid. All right, so the rheumatoid factors... In the polyarticular onset, so if, they're, if they have positive rheumatoid factor and it's an adolescent, they're going to look a lot like an adult with rheumatoid arthritis. That's a bad prognostic sign. So they might ask you that. If you've got a kid with poly, an adolescent with polyarticular disease and the rheumatoid factor is positive, that's a bad prognostic sign. 
Uh, 30% of these kids will be ANA positive as well, like we saw with the, with the um, oligo articular form. But uveitis isn't as common in this one. Okay? Now, if they're a young kid and their ANA is positive with this, we're still going to do the screening because uveitis can occur. Okay? So the most important thing is with oligo, if their ANA is positive, for sure you're going to screen them. The poly, polyarticular with a positive ANA, you're going to be thinking about screening them as well, most likely. Okay, treatment. I've listed these for you here. I don't know how much of this they would ask you on the test. I think the biggest thing you need to be aware of is that, you know, initially for every kid who came in initially and they didn't have, they had very mild disease, we just started with NSAIDs only. Now most rheumatologists are switching over to also beginning the DMARDs, okay, the disease modifying uh, drugs. And so the, these drugs down here are the most commonly used. So methotrexate we most com is one of the most commonly used in kids still. And the reason is, is that even though they're mild disease, we know that if we start with these, that's the name is there, disease modifying, it actually will help prevent the changes that occur as far as with the arthritis. Okay. These kids do better. So most kids are going to be put on NSAIDs plus one of the DMARDs. Okay. Particularly if, they, if they've got moderate disease or severe, then for sure they're going to be put on that. If they've got lots of disease, you can do the, the newer drugs, the, um, the MABs. You look for the MAB in the answer, and that's what's commonly used. I think this is probably more of they're going to let you go to see a rheumatologist first for this, but I doubt they'll ask you about this. Now, when do you use steroids? The key is you don't want to use them very much at all, only in these situations with flares. So if they've got a big flare, you're going to use it, and then you're going to use as small a dose as possible. The key in pediatric disease with JIA is you want to use the least amount of steroids as possible. Okay, very different than what we used to do in the past. Okay, so here's a question. It's Jessica. She's two and a half years old. It's, she's a girl with the increasing incidence of morning stiffness that improves with play and movement as the morning goes on. Her mother's noted that she doesn't like to run as much and is much less willing to climb. The arthritis mainly affects only her knee or ankle. She does not have fever, rash, or night pain. She's known to have a uveitis and has a positive ANA, but a normal sed rate, hemoglobin, and a C-reactive protein. Her rheumatoid factor is negative. So which of the following do you think she has? Enthesitis, oligoarticular JAA, polyarticular JAA, systemic onset, or juvenile psoriatic arthritis? Okay, great. I mean, she's the poster child, right? I mean, she pretty much that gave you everything. And the test is pretty good about doing that because these are hard to figure out. And so they're not going to try to confuse you and give you factors that go with one and the other and make you pick be over one thing or the other. They're going to be pretty obvious about these. So this one is a very straightforward oligo. Good. Okay. Just very briefly on juvenile psoriatic arthritis. Do the in the case definition, the, the, this likes to appear on the test because what they like to do is show you pictures or describe something weird in the question and see if you know what it is. So obviously they gave you a, somebody with arthritis and psoriasis, right? You'd say, oh, that's juvenile psoriatic arthritis. Okay, so they're not going to give you that. They're not going to say psoriasis anywhere in the, in the question. So what they're going to say is they have arthritis and they have pitting of their nails, okay? or they have dactylitis, but common thing they'll give you is the pitting nails. The pitting nails with an arthritis, they're trying to steer you toward juvenile psoriatic arthritis. They could be nice and say that the mom, there's a mom with, psor with psoriasis in the family. Well, they say psoriasis, that kind of gives it away, so they're not likely to do that. Now, the arthritis can precede the psoriasis by many years, so that's the reason why we look for these other things here, okay? Family history, or you look for nail pitting, because the arthritis commonly occurs before they get the, psor the psoriasis rash. The DIP joints are the most common to be involved. Uveitis is common with this one too, so we're going to be screening them for that. And again, an ANA can be positive in, in this group as well. If it's a younger child, it's going to be more common in girls. For adolescents, it's more common in boys. 
Okay, so it kind of reverses there. All right, enthesitis, the enthesitis-related arthritis, or formerly known as spondyloarthropathies, that includes this list here, which we're going to talk about. So first thing is, what is an enthesitis? Okay, well, what is an emphasis, or however you say it? So it, all this is is inflammation, okay? And this is where the, the tendons and the ligaments or the fascia are attaching the bone, okay? So it's where some other tissue is attaching to the bone. You get an inflammation there, and that's an enthesitis, okay? That's what they're talking about here. So ERA, this is the... Um, the most common of these that we're going to talk about, the spondyloarthropathies, it's about half as common as what we saw with JIA. So about 20 out of 100,000 children are affected. Significant findings with this is usually you'll find this HLA B27. This is the classic thing they'll give you on the PEDS test. They'll give you this to help you, okay? They'll give you. Medicine people, you know this is not, don't worry about this, but the PEDS people know this is definitely you need this is, they're going to give it to you on the test. It means this is what they have, so just go for it. You'll be right. It's more commonly seen in older kids. Again, this is a male disease, so this is a more commonly seen in males. It can occur in families, which they won't give you on the test because that would give it away. And the arthritis here generally is peripheral, okay? It's going to be a peripheral arthritis, and usually what you'll see is lower limb involvement that's asymmetric, okay? So it's going to be lower limb, asymmetric, and commonly you'll see, like, the spine involved um, in some of these kids. All right. So the key to make this is they've got to have arthritis and the enthesitis, or they have arthritis, or they have enthesitis, and they have two of the following. And so if they have sacroiliac joint tenderness and HLA B27, they have a first-degree relative who's HLA B27 positive, acute uveitis, or onset of arthritis in a boy after six. So this is the, if they give you a boy who has arthritis and they're 10 or 12, you want to be thinking about it, okay, but make sure that the, the history fits, and that's what happened with our first case, right? Everything fit with him. So he had arthritis, he had the sacroiliac involvement, and he had, he's on, he was older than six years old, and he was a boy, okay? And he had the HLA B27, so they gave you everything for that kid. Okay, so again, this is boys, morning pain or stiffness that improves with playing. So a lot of the rheumatologic diseases do this. Commonly, they'll talk about pain in the butt. Okay, so the kid complains of pain in their lower back or in their buttocks. And then when you palpate these areas where, these, where the fascia or the tendon or the ligament is attaching to where their pain is, and you touch that, they're going to have a lot of pain with that. That's a clue to help you on the test. The sacroiliac pain is reproducible. The iritis, may, there is an iritis with this one instead of uveitis, so it's acute, acutely painful red eye can occur in 5 to 10%. Sed rate may or may not be helpful to you, and then, but the HLA-B27, just know it. That's your clue. All right, treatment, I wouldn't spend too much time on learning these because I think they're going to let you refer this. First line, generally we're going to try NSAIDs first. Uh, with this group, and then if they don't improve in a month, then we'll move on to some of the other agents here that are listed. I think you do need to be, this is one where, be very careful of diseases where you hear about where there's some overlap. Like, so here's a GI disease with rheumatology. They love to hit on things that might hit two different subject areas. So inflammatory bowel disease associated arthropathy is, is very common um, in, in these kids who have inflammatory bowel disease. And so they have an arthritis. Be very suspicious it's one of these. If it's a peripheral joint, um, generally girls and boys are equally effective, and this one's not associated with HLA B27. And the, the kind of the cool thing with this is that the arthritis fl flares are going to occur with the gut flare. So if you can keep the gut disease under control, you keep the arthritis under control. Okay? So if you can keep the gut under control, the arthritis is under control. For the axial joints, much more common in boys, HLA B27 positive, it, 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 they don't really go together. So they have inflammatory bowel disease, you treat that, it gets better, but their arthritis won't necessarily get better because their bowel disease is improved. Okay, briefly on reactive arthritis, a favorite for the test, he used to be known as Ryder disease, but we've gotten away from using his name because he was associated with a Nazi atrocity, so you won't see that probably on the test anymore. 
Um, they'll call it reactive arthritis. Um, and the, the, the key thing with this one is there's going to be some history of some GI infection um, or maybe a GU infection within the last one to four weeks. So they had some kind of diarrheal illness or they had a urethritis in the last couple of weeks, and now they come in with an arthritis with a conjunctivitis, and they have urethritis. So these three, three, three things, arthritis with conjunctivitis and urethritis. They'll commonly have oral genital ulcers with it. Usually it's an arthritis of a big joint, okay? So like a hip. Fever is common. It'll last three to six weeks, and you just treat them with NSAIDs. Sometimes doxycycline is helpful. I think they mainly want you to figure out what's going on here, okay? That this is reactive arthritis. All right, Lyme disease, um, we stuck in here because if it's an arthritis-causing uh, type illness. Um, it's, remember, it's transmitted by the ixodes, ticks. Um, you always want to think about geography with this question. So the northeast, the upper Midwest, Wisconsin area is a big hotbed um, for Lyme, and then California. So northeast, upper Midwest, Wisconsin in particular, and then California. Think about Lyme disease from those areas. They may just show you the rash, erythema migraines. If they do, that makes your diagnosis. Okay, don't do any testing. Don't do anything else after that. Just treat them and move on. Okay, and they'll ask you about that. Okay, early on, they get the rash with fever. Remember, Lyme is a spirochete like syphilis. So if you don't treat it, it's going to travel throughout the body and pretty much go everywhere that syphilis might go. So weeks to months later, if they're not treated, they can get meningitis or a neuritis, and they may present with as a peripheral neuropathy, like a, a foot drop, or they may present with Bell's palsy, and that's a classic one that'll show up on the, on the boards is Bell's palsy. So an isolated Bell's palsy, they don't really give you much else, but they live in New England or Wisconsin area, and they have this isolated Bell's palsy. Be very, very suspicious that this is Lyme disease. Remember, this is where you can get heart block, the cardiac effect, and then the arthritis, which is why we're talking about here, um, is common. Treatment, if it's early, like with the rash or arthritis, you're going to use doxycycline. If it's a meningitis or choroiditis, you're going to use ceftriaxone. You're going to treat for at least two weeks, and then you want to give, the question is about um, prophylaxis for hikers and campers, and then for the board tests or pediatric boards, it's not indicated. Okay, we're not going to do that. The classic question they'll give you is someone, they got some kid on the test who's been hiking in Lyme, Connecticut, um, and they'll say Lyme, Connecticut, and, you know, they went hiking this morning, they come home eight hours later, and they find they, find they have a tick on them. And the, so the longest a tick could have possibly been there was eight hours and one minute, and they want to know what you do. Well, you remove the tick carefully, and you don't treat them. The tick needs to be on at least 24 hours before transmission can occur, okay? So after 24 hours, yes, you're worried. And in some, some institutions, they will give a one-deal um, pill of doxycycline. But for the boards, they're not going to ask you about that, okay? That's controversial. It's not something that's standard of care. So it's, it's not something they'll ask you about. The main thing is they want you to know not to give prophylaxis for the tick that's been there for two hours. All right, so here's uh, what, it, what these ticks looks like. This is the tick who just ate, and for HIPAA reasons, had to cover their eyes, so. <laughs> anyway. Okay, this is a terrible picture of erythema migrans. It doesn't even look like that, okay? And I'll show you a real, a decent picture. The point here is on the test, with your screen, you may get a bad, you know, your screen won't be bad, but, you know, you know, you're, you're taking, this is the first year they're having the test on computers. So my guess is whatever pictures they have there, they're going to make sure that they're good. So I doubt they'll show you one that, like this. This is more of the classic erythema migraines, okay? So here you've got the kind of central pallor here, with the tick bike, and then you have this ring lesion around this. So I would know this because the reason is if, if they show you this, you know this is Lyme disease, and you just treat, and you don't want to check any serology. Okay, you don't want to check for Lyme. The serology tests are horrible. You don't want to rely on them unless you absolutely have to. You know, if someone came in with arthritis, and they lived in a, in a Lyme area, for sure I'd check. I was sure I would check for Lyme disease then with the serology. But, you know, if they lived in, you know, Louisiana, where there's no Lyme disease, then I'm not going to be checking 
Lyme serology, I'm going to be checking for something else. Okay. So here's a 16-year-old girl from New England. She comes in with the rash shown on the next slide. She's been hiking but has not noted a tick bite. She has no other symptoms or signs at the moment besides just this rash. So here's her rash. Okay. What is the next step in her workup? You want to check Lyme serology, check her for gonorrhea, start therapy with doxycycline, start therapy with ceftriaxone, or do in the lumbar puncture. So what do you all want to do? Okay, good. All right, so you listen to me here. Now, <laughs> when you go back home, do whatever you want, okay, as far as checking the Lyme titers. I know, you know, those of you that are, anyway, I know what happens in the real world versus the test. So we're teaching you the test. The key thing here is do not check Lyme serology on her, okay? Do not, do not, do not. You don't, they may say, you want to confirm your diagnosis. No, if you see the rash, she has Lyme disease. So just treat her with doxycycline, okay? Just treat her with, with doxycycline. A few of you thought she had gonorrhea, thought she was from the Jersey Shore area, but she's not. So, <laughs> anyway, okay. Somebody wanted to tap her. Okay. All right, here's Jeremy Lyon. He's a four-year-old boy from Connecticut. He had a cold about a week ago, and it seemed to resolve with minimal symptoms. His mother noted that he had small bumps on his legs that have grown in size the last two days. It spread to his buttocks area when she brings him to see you. On exam, you also note a swollen right knee that he says started hurting this morning. While in the ra waiting room, he complained of stomach pain and vomited on your new carpet. You note scattered petechiae and purpura over his lower extremities and in his buttocks area. The rash does not extend up the back or trunk. Which of the following? Okay, so this is classic PEDS board exam, right? So you're reading along, you figure out what the diagnosis is, and then they ask you something totally off the wall. And it's like, oh, man. So this is, this is the problem with PEDS boards is they like to do this. So here they're going to ask you, you think you're, you're going great. They're just going to ask you what the diagnosis is, and they go, no, which of the following is not associated with this, this, dis with this disorder? Now, they've gotten away from the not questions. The only reason I put a not question in, or we use not questions, because I want to teach you four things that are associated with this. So you need to figure out which one of these is not associated with this disorder. So is it occult GI bleeding, chronic arthritis, ileo-ileo interception, high drops of the gallbladder, or orchitis? So put your answer in. Okay, kind of all over the board. All right, good. So this is kind of like the test that y'all took last night, right? So B, <laughs> B is the right answer here. B, B is in boy. Okay, so everything else, what does this kid have? HSP. Okay, HSP. All right, we're going to talk about that. But the thing that they do not get is a chronic arthritis. Okay, they don't get a chronic arthritis. Now, they can, the presenting sign can be an it supposedly may have been on a test somewhere, is orchitis. So I would know that. Okay, so let's talk about HSP, or anaphylactoid purpura. It's the most common diagnosed vasculitidae in childhood. You will see this on the test, I promise. It'll be there. It may be on there two or three times. Okay, I don't, it just depends what they're trying to pick on or do. Mean age is about four years. Most, most of these kids are under seven. Boys more common than girls. They may give you season because it seems to be more common in the winter and the spring. This is an IgA-mediated disease. I would know that. So they, that's in here. They can bring in immunology and to combine it with a room, you know, and then you're going to hear about this again in nephrology. I mean, you hear this. This disease is every, every you know, thing is responsible here. Triggers, infections can trigger it. Drugs can trigger it. You know, anyway, half these kids had a preceding URI. All right, skin lesions, you have to have skin lesions, okay, 100%. Now, it may not occur, though, at the very beginning, and that's the problem with this disease, right? Because without them, it's hard to tell what's going on. In half, it'll be the presenting finding, which will be helpful to you, okay? So in half, they'll have the skin. Remember, it's the small wheels or red um, papules, petechia and purpura. Um, and Amy will show you pictures of this in, in derm, and I think... Um, in nephrology, you'll see some more pictures of it. Remember, this is lower extremities and buttocks. That's the classic thing. Remember, it doesn't usually get to the trunk or go much further than that. 
So it's always on the buttocks, always lower extremities. Now, young little kids, yes, face and ears are more commonly seen, and the rash generally lasts four days to four weeks. Now, the joints are next most common. That's why we're talking about here in room. So a quarter will present with the joint finding first, so with arthritis, okay? They won't have joint effusions, though, okay? They won't have joint effusions. What they'll have is a periarthritis with edema around the joint. So the joint itself won't have fluid in it, but there will be edema around the joint. GI is the third most common, and this is what they like to give us on the test of the GI complaints. So the abdominal pain with vomiting, occult bleeding is common, melanoma can occur at a third Sometimes these people who do have occult bleeding. Remember the thickened gallbladder that Mark talked about? This is the time you'll see it. And then ileo ileo interception occurs in 2 to 14 percent if they have abdominal complaints. The renal, anywhere from 10 to 50 percent. Usually it's mild and transient. You may just see an isolated microscopic hematuria, proteinuria. Now, rare is this orchitis. And I throw it in here because there's a reason, because it may appear on a test. So just be aware, orchitis can be seen with this. And it can be the primary initial presentation. Okay? So a kid, you know, a four-year-old boy with orchitis, little thing should go off in your head. Okay, it's probably not chlamydia or gonorrhea. <laughs> you know, it's probably, you know, think about HSP. Okay, remember, high Y count, high set rate. If you check an IgA level, it will be high, normal platelets, and then you can see the gallbladder high. If they come with abdominal pain, they may get an ultrasound, and you'll see the gallbladder high drops. Treatment, as you know, is supportive. Steroids, I'm sorry, steroids um, have been used, but don't use them on the test. There's no controlled trials that support steroid use. Okay, so we're not going to use steroids in these kids. Most of these kids will get better in four weeks. What you need to be aware of, I think, too, for the test is recurrences are common, and 40% may have another one happen, episode, anywhere from six weeks to two years out. Okay, so just be aware it can happen 40% of the time. Kawasaki is going to cover cards, so we won't talk about here. Very, very rare in children. Very, very common on the test. Okay, so you'll see Wegener's on there as a distractor most of the time. Okay, it's not going to be the right answer, but they'll stick it in there because they'll, they'll just put it on there because they'll say, we don't, you, you don't know what that is, and maybe that's what I'll pick. They've changed the name in the, in the adult literature. Again, we're getting away, away from eponyms. So now we're calling this thing granulomatous, I'm sorry, granulomatosis with polyangitis. So Pete's board's a little bit behind. I don't think they'll switch to the new name. Um, but if you see that, they may use this new name just to confuse you so you don't know what's going on. But that's what, it's just Wegener's, okay? It's granulomatosis polyangitis. What you get is a necrotizing granulomatous vasculitis of the small vessels, okay? And it's particularly going to affect the respiratory tract and the kidney. So this is a lung kidney thing. That's how, I'll, you know, everyone remembers it that way, and that's the right way to remember it. It's a pulmonary renal syndrome. Commonly, they'll talk about a nasal deformity. And there you may see C anca positive, and that's very helpful for you. Okay. I wouldn't worry about treatment. You're not, I'm not treating Wegener's in my general peds practice by myself. So, you know, you're not going to be treating this. Know to make the diagnosis, how to make it, in case they do give you a question with it, and know what C anca is your, your key thing here. Bichette's disease, very common on the test. And because this is a weird one, this is a vasculitis of arteries and veins, of both. Okay, this is the only one to do this, so this is why it may appear on the test because it's it's different. You get a neutrophilic infiltrate in the arterioles and the venules, and the, there's a classic triad here which they almost always give you on the test. They'll give you painful oral ulcers, painful genital ulcers, and then some kind of inflammatory eye disease. So look for the eye, the genitals, and the mouth. Okay. Skin lesions are common. Erythema nodosum is the one that they're likely to show you, and then you. They may talk about this pathergy test, and this is where you prick the skin, and in 48 hours, you'll see a pustule or papule form. And treatment, generally, we're going to use steroids. Okay, moving to lupus real quick. How can you differentiate systemic lupus from systemic JIA? So is fever not common in systemic JIA? Is less than 5% of lupus diagnosed in children under the age of 18? 
X-rays and pediatric lupus are normal, unlike in systemic GIA where you see osteopenia and joint damage. Pericarditis is very rare in lupus, or the SED rate is going to be low in systemic GIA. So which one of these is going to help you figure out is it GIA or lupus? Okay, good. So again, just like last night. All right. So the point here is that C is the right answer. Okay, C is the right answer. And that's the key thing is, remember with JIA, what we, why we're using those DMARDs, disease-modifying drugs, is because we want to prevent the disease from affecting the bone, from causing arthritis problems in the bone. What's interesting with pediatric lupus, okay, the x-rays are normal. Okay, they don't have bone changes from the lupus. Okay. Everything else here is true that's listed, and we'll talk about lupus now. 20% of, of lupus is actually diagnosed in children under the age of 18. So for peds board, you've got to know it, okay, because one in five cases of lupus are diagnosed in, the, in the, what we consider the prime pediatric age group, which is less than 18. It's rare before age five, but we're seeing an increasing incidence after 10 years of age. So in those younger adolescents, we're starting to see more and more cases for some reason. On the test, if they give you ethnicity or race, they're giving it to you for a reason. Because otherwise, there's no reason to tell you that someone's an African-American kid or a Hispanic kid or a Caucasian kid. So if they're giving you race, pay very, very close attention to that. That's a clue. Okay, that's telling you that something, there's some, something that occurs more commonly in that particular um, race or, or ethnic group. Girls are much more common um, be affected as we see in adults and in, in children. So girls, much more common. All right, the labs here can be helpful. So the ANA in kids is always going to be positive. If the ANA is negative, don't pick lupus on the test. Okay, yes, there is an ANA negative lupus, but not in pediatric on the board test. They're not going to give you that. That is really rare. The anti-double-stranded DNA is a common one they'll give us in pediatrics to help you really nail it. So know that one. <clears throat> Anti-Smith is found about 33%, so less likely to be on there. Complement levels are low. Okay, that's a clue. So C3, C4 are going to be low. They're going to be chewing up their complement. If they talk about a mom who's had a bunch of miscarriages, no, they're trying to get you to think of antiphospholipid antibody. So the mother's had a bunch of miscarriages, okay, or she's had a blood clot, be thinking about antiphospholipid antibodies, um, commonly associated with lupus. For kids, most common presentation, fever, weight loss, lethargy, arthritis in 80-90%. Commonly it's going to be multiple joints, small and large joints, and the x-rays are going to be normal, and that's your clue that this is not JIA. You're all familiar with the Malar rash? <coughs> Excuse me. And then... Um, they may have alopecia, and that's a clue, too. If they give an adolescent who has hair loss, be very, very suspicious of lupus and syphilis. That's what I'd remember. Hair loss in an adolescent, be suspicious of lupus and syphilis. Kidney disease is, is very common. CNS disease, 10 to 30 percent. The most common cause of chorea in the United States is, is lupus, okay? So if they give you some kid or the, you know, adolescent girl who they say she won't stop break dancing in class, you know, <laughs> and that's what it kind of looks like, and just be very suspicious about lupus um, in her. Commonly, they'll have seizures associated with CNS disease, and they may present with psychiatric disease, so you just want to keep that in the back of your mind. If, if a girl's been normal and now suddenly has a psychiatric illness, um, and particularly if they say she's an African-American girl, then be very suspicious that they're trying to get you to think lupus. The hematologic things are very common, anemia, low white count, low platelet count. And then cardiac disease, pericarditis is, is fairly common in this age group as well. All right, you've got to have four of these 11. I would not worry about memorizing all of these. Just be familiar with them. If you start seeing a scenario, and particularly let's say an African-American girl who's got uh, multi, who's got this rash, and then she's got ulcers, and then she's got renal disease. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then they give you some of these tests down here. So this is the classic Malar rash. Okay. Treatment, 
I really wouldn't worry too much about treatment. They're going to want you to diagnose her, and then I think they're going to have somebody else see her, okay, or at least figure out what's going on. So I would just know for flares, we're going to use steroids, but in general, again, you want to stay away from steroids in rheumatologic diseases. You want to use something else. The big thing they may ask you about is someone who's been on a lot of steroids, what do you look out for? The big one on the test is avascular necrosis, okay, avascular necrosis. Mixed connective tissue disease, I wouldn't worry too much about this. I give it to you here just because they commonly will give it as a distractor on the test. I'm not going to ask you about it, <clears throat> but just know what these things are. Okay, Shogun syndrome, <clears throat> the main thing here is the dry eyes. So dry eyes, dry mouth, I think I have Shogun syndrome right now. And uh, you need to look for these two antibodies down here. Okay, anti-Rho, anti-La, <clears throat> look for them. Okay, so on the test, look out for a kid who's got recurrent um, parotid swelling, and they complain of dry eyes and dry mouth. Look, be on the lookout for that. Okay, juvenile dermatomyositis, a classic one they love to give you on the test. Um, generally, it's a younger girl, three to seven. It's girls, three to seven, early teenage. <clears throat> and they have this rash with this... Uh, Classic heliotrope, so they get this, I'll show you a picture of this in just a second, but it's just, it looks like they got makeup on, okay? So classically what will happen is the, the mom will think the kid has makeup and try to wipe it off, and they, they can't, or they go to grandma's house and she see, well, you know, why does she have makeup? And she doesn't, it's just she's got this, uh, this classic heliotrope rash, so it's this purple to red discoloration around the eyelids, and then Gotrans papules, I'll show you a picture of that, too. It's on the extensor surfaces of the, of the hands, generally on the knuckles. You see them across the knuckles. And then the, the big thing is the proximal muscle weakness associated with this. Steroids is what you want to use for therapy. So here's the heliotrope rash here. You can see it really well. Okay. And then the papule, Gotron's papules here and here. Okay. Scleroderma is really rare in kids. Amy will talk about this in derm more. <clears throat> You're familiar with Crest syndrome, and then I've listed those for you here, so talk about this more. And then localized, we, we call it morphia. Um, so localized scleroderma, yeah, used to we, we used to call morphia. Okay, growing pains. Most common cause of recurrent limb pain in kids. It's usually benign nocturnal pains of childhood. It's a deep aching uh, pain in the non-articular areas particularly the thighs and the calves. So thigh pain, very, very common. Usually it's bilateral. If it's not bilateral in the test, think of something else or be very suspicious that they're trying to fool you and thinking it's growing pains if it's just one leg that they're having the pain in. It's usually in the evening time and usually it will awaken them from sleep. There are not morning symptoms here. So remember, they have morning symptoms. We go off on the JIA and the enthesitis track with Without the morning symptoms, just evening time, if you just and it's bilateral, just pain. Okay, there's no arthritis, just pain like in the thighs. Um, be very suspicious of growing pain. Treatment is just time. Okay, treatment is just time. Usually it'll disappear by 12 to 13 years of age. Hypermobility syndrome, very common in kids. Um, mostly girls, 4 to 13 percent of girls have have this. Um, if it's found on the test, be thinking about inherited diseases like Ehlers-Danlos, <clears throat> but usually it's not there. If they have pain, you can treat them with, with non-steroidals. Swimming is a good therapy. Okay, fibromyalgia syndrome in kids. Most commonly we see it in women, 20 to 50 years old. Okay, in the adult literature, we've got new diagnostic criteria that got rid of all those trigger points. Okay, that came out in 2010. But for pediatrics, it's not validated. So in peds, we're still using the trigger points, okay? So just be aware of that. Most commonly, if we're going to see it in kids, is girls 13 to 15 years of age. Um, they got to have three body areas of pain for at least three months, and you need to find the tender points. And I've got the picture for you in your, in your syllabus. And in kids, you need fewer. So in general, if they talk about a 14-year-old girl who has stiffness commonly in the morning, and then they have these trigger points. They're trying to get you to think of fibromyalgia. Okay. Treatment, NSAIDs, acetaminophen, amitriptyline. Here's your, the trigger points for you. I wouldn't worry too much about memorizing where all these are. They're not going to give you this. They'll just talk about trigger points, and that'll be the clue. 
very briefly on periodic fever, aphthos, aphthos stomatitis, pharyngitis, cervical adenitis, so PFA, PA. Be familiar with this. This is, it, it presents with these, all of these. I'll give you all of these on the test. They'll have fever that's recurrent. It'll last five to seven days. It'll go away. It'll come back for five to seven days. It'll go away. It'll come back for five to seven days. As soon as you put them on steroids, they're completely better, okay, markedly better. They have, there have been some studies giving cimetidine and or taking their tonsils out. And for some reason, that works. No one really knows, knows why. The differentiated from uh, familial Mediterranean fever, which we'll talk about next, um, it's just the fever here lasts a lot longer. Also, you have all these other things going on up here. So speaking of familial Mediterranean fever, it's autosome recessive. Again, commonly on the test is there as a distractor. Okay, they put it in there because they say, oh, I don't know what that is. Maybe they'll, you'll pick it. So just be aware, um, it's, it's pretty rare in the United States. Most commonly, if we're going to see it, it's going to be people from the Mediterranean, have Mediterranean heritage. Um, so just be aware of that. They may ask you about the gene sometimes. So this is on gene on chromosome 16. And what happens is um, the this product of this gene um, regulates p the poly's inflammatory response. Okay, so it's it's an inflammatory response that's dysregulated, and so they get problems with that. Most commonly, it's going to present before age 10. They'll have fever cycles of three to five days once a month, and when they have the fever, they're going to have abdominal pain. That's your clue here. So fever with abdominal pain. And they may get other things, too, like we would see with lupus, so it gets confusing because they have pericarditis, et cetera. In general, though, what the classic thing will be the fever with abdominal pain. That's your clue if you're thinking about familial Mediterranean fever. They respond to colchicine. So they may ask you that. That's one of the weird things they may ask you about is treatments, colchicine. Very end here, I've listed <coughs> key words for you to remember. So just go through these. Um, on your own. We haven't talked about GC yet, um, which we will when we talk about STDs, um, but these will be clues to when you go back and review this material to think about uh, the things that we talked about. Okay, and the very last thing here I've listed for you is a chart just to kind of, so you can keep these straight, where, who they occur in, what ages you want to be looking at, um, and then how they present. So uh, just things that are yes and no, make sure you know which ones are yeses, because that'll help you figure out what the, tip, the classic disease presentation is going to be. Okay.